American bombers assemble at a secret airdrome somewhere along the northern tip of Australia. The order of the day, attack. Behind me is a Martin B-26 Marauder. It was a medium bomber used in World War II. The crew was just six young men who, just like myself, were recent high school graduates. It amazes me that the men who use the firepower in this war machine were just as young as I am. When they joined the Army Air Corps for World War II, they were called recruits. Then they became trainees, where they became pilots, navigators, radio operators, bombardiers, and gunners. Then they flew their first mission and forged in that fire they forever refer to themselves as Marauder Men. In this edition of Marauder Men, we'll learn of how it protected the homeland in the Alaskan Aleutian Islands, its use in the Pacific on Midway and Guadalcanal. Join us for a history lesson from the men who lived it. The B-26 featured at MAPS Air Museum never flew in combat. It crashed in 1942 while flying from California to its wartime base in the Alaskan Aleutian Islands. It was one of three B-26s that were forced down in the Yukon Territory of Canada. The crash is an example of how ill-prepared America was at the beginning of the war. The pilots had little training in the B-26. My pilot was designated pilot by virtue of the fact that he outranked me by weeks. He also had, had one or two landings in the B-26, which I had not had at that time. So when I climbed into the plane with him in Sacramento to start for Alaska, I had had a total of 10 hours of observer and co-pilot time in the B-26. There were no maps available of the flight path they were to take, and they got lost. There was no weather forecasting along the route they were to fly, and they ended up fighting a winter storm. Finally, as darkness was falling, the pilots and crew were forced to belly in when they ran out of gas. And with the bad weather, it was decided by the pilots of the flight to crash land the three ships in a high, shallow valley, roughly about 5,000 feet above sea level, in the foothills of the Canadian Rockies. We hit the snow and crashed. The plane went up on its nose and crashed the entire cockpit area open. The pilot went out through the windshield, landed about 15 feet in front of the plane, I was knocked out in the seat itself. We were sheltered under the wing by the rest of the crew who had come through safely. And through typical Yankee ingenuity, they had taken the wing covers we had carried, we were carrying with us. And it formed a shelter over one of the wings. And so we were in that shelter well out of the weather. Laying in our shelter on the wing, we heard this low droning voice, this low droning sound over the southern horizon, we looked out and there, going from left to right, you saw the C-47, one big dot, and about four or five small dots, the P-40s, we had some flares. So when we heard and saw those little dots along the horizon, all the crews that go with this 4th of July display of fireworks, and pretty soon we saw those ships gradually turn toward us and they flew over us, and of course we were extremely happy because they knew even though while we were still lost, they knew where we were. Over several days, bush pilots in small planes flew the downed crews out two and three at a time. It was the early part of the war, and some parts of the airplanes were needed to repair others. Later on in the April of 1942, the Air Force sent in a ground crew to reclaim some of the parts off of these crash planes. And the parts we received uh, from that uh, reclamation project uh, turned out to be really our air depot and supply depot for our Aleutian campaign, which is soon to come up. Right after the attack on Pearl Harbor, there was a, a genuine concern that the Japanese could attack Alaska and the Aleutian Islands, or the Alaskan Territory at that time, in an impossible invasion of North America. The posting to Alaska meant working in a very inhospitable environment. 
The ground crews had to battle the elements to keep the 25,000 parts in a B-26 in flying condition. I can't say enough for the ground crews and the conditions they had to work under. Uh, they would get frost by their hands, the, uh, the gasoline when, when they would be testing it and, and draining the tanks and so forth would cause frostbite and the like. And they, we had no hangers at all. We had nothing but repentance out there in the, in the chain. Yet those men were working day and night on engines, doing everything they could possibly do. The pilots were soon introduced to a new weapon and were expected to master it with about 15 minutes of training. We were called together in a room, and in this room, up at the head, by the backboard, that a naval officer with an object in his hand, about the size of a dinner plate, and about two inches thick. On top were a lot of calibrations. Our commanding officer stood up and she, he said, from now on, fellas, we're gonna be torpedo bombers. And then he pointed to the Navy officer and said, now, Lieutenant so-and-so will explain to you how to operate a torpedo site. This officer stood up and held up before us this drone-like object and said, this is, a, this is a torpedo site. And of course, we were duly impressed. And after about 15 minutes, he says, are there any questions? And we were now instant torpedo bombers. He had told us that when we get down to UMNAC, there we'll see six torpedoes ready for us. The Navy will install them on our planes. At that time, we hadn't even seen one. As the war started, the Japanese codes had been broken. So the United States knew that as part of a planned invasion of the Midway Islands in the Pacific, there would be a diversionary attack on the Aleutian Islands. The B-26 crews were soon called upon to join in combat with the Japanese Navy. Unfortunately, the training for the Alaskan crews had neglected to include one important detail of how to attack using a torpedo. Captain Thornborough, who uh, of the uh, 73rd Bomb Squadron, he found the carrier, dropped his torpedo, and it on the deck of the carrier it bounced off. But they, because the Navy hadn't told him that it has to run in the water a while before <laughs> uh, they're armed. Well, he got back. He said, give me bombs, and he went back out, but he never showed up again, so we don't know what happened to him. The Marauder served for 18 months in the brutal Alaskan weather. The B-26s, while they were still there, were used to attack the Japanese installations on Attu and Kiska on a fairly regular basis. The frigid Alaskan environment was more deadly than the enemy. One crew member remarked, it was damned cold. I wouldn't want to take a brass monkey up there today. During the first seven months of the war, from June 1st, 1942 to December 31st, 1942, we lost 35 planes to weather and six planes to combat. The B-26 was pulled out of the Aleutians in 1943. As men were freezing in Alaska, the Marauder men and their B-26s were also being sent to the Pacific Theater of Operations. However, just getting there was a perilous journey. We left Hamilton on the 2nd of June with a 4,000 pound overload of gasoline. And some of us were able to fly over the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Some of us had to fly under it because we couldn't gain enough altitude. We were at cruise to uh, Hickam Field at 170 knots all the way, and we were supposed to make it with 100 gallons of gas to spare. Uh, some were a little less than that, but most of us had roughly about 30 minutes of flying time left. Cousin Huglin gave us a briefing. He said, if anybody has trouble on the way over, don't do too much to try to help them, or you might not make it either. He said, be damned hard-hearted. These were his words. In other words, if somebody goes down, don't try to help them by dropping the life raft to them or anything else, or you might not make it either. And his words were very good because there were about 20 minutes of gasoline left over after we got to Hawaii. Um, when American code breakers had broken the Japanese code, knew that the Japanese were going to attack and invade Midway Island. The morning of the attack, 
all of the aircraft on the airfield were set off in, a, to, in an uncoordinated attack on the Japanese aircraft carriers. On one side of the map's B-26, it bears the name Suzy Q. That's in honor of the plane that flew its one and only combat mission. Four of the B-26s attacked early in that morning. They were the second group of aircraft to attack the Japanese carriers that morning. Came in with no fighter escort, were jumped upon by the Japanese Zeros flying cap, and two out of four of them were shot down. The other two were heavily shot up. None of the torpedoes hit the Japanese carriers, but it did have a bit of a psychological impact. Um, there was this one moment where James Murray from the 22nd Bomb Group was flying his B-26 Suzy Q after dropping the torpedo and went right down the flight, right above the flight deck of the Japanese flagship Akagi. In the, some of the memoirs of the officers on the bridge talk about how they all dived down onto the deck, including Admiral Nagumo, the head of the fleet. But we went on out and were down low, 50, 100 feet off the water and suddenly popped over the horizon was a whole flock of Japanese ships. And there were everywhere. After our launch, the Akago was turning toward us and we had been coming in from 45 off the bow. So it was almost a straight shot down the flight deck. In fact, low enough that I think we could have touched the deck with our wheels if we had put them down. And we had no defense except speed. We got on the water. I sat there driving that machine with the throttles all the way to the hill. Fast enough that a zero was coming down out of dives could pull up alongside of us, but when they rolled up to fire through, they just simply fell off and we go on. But we did finally get away from the Japanese zeros. And then of course we were lost. Nobody was thinking about position or where it was midway or anything else. We were away from the Japanese fleet and we had a lot of wounded and bad damage to the airplane. Spotted a smudge of smoke on the horizon and we turned toward it and sure enough, that was Penn Island Marine. And we got on a final approach and thought, well, this is it, we've got it made now. And the Marines didn't know who we were and they cut loose with their anti-aircraft weapons and drove us back out to sea. So in the next round, when we got on final, we had to come in and land, there was no place else to go. And whether they suddenly realized that we were friendly or not, I don't remember, but they quit shooting and we came in and made a reasonably decent landing and got the wounded out and got them some medical attention and went back and started counting and one side there were over 500 holes, just on one side. We never did count the other side. Surviving this much battle damage was one of the reasons the B-26 became a favorite for its crews. It could bring them back alive. But the airplane was tough. It was extremely tough. And I doubt seriously that a um, regular combat airplane could have stood up to it as the B-26 did. While the B-26 caused no battle damage during the engagement, its presence in the fight created an opportunity for the battle to be won. It caused the Japanese fighters to stay in the water. The, the Navy's airplanes coming in from the carriers were on the deck. We were on the deck. Uh, so they were down shooting us and the dive bombers off of our carriers managed to get in and made their dives and got their hits. And then it was too late for the zeros. Nothing they could do about it anymore. And they hit them all. I mean, those dive bombers hit every carrier. And where was it going to land? They had to land in the ocean. The Marauder men were spread out all over the Pacific. Some groups were stationed in Fiji, while others flew on to Australia. The strategy in the Pacific was island hopping. You invade an island, secure it, then move on to the next island. When the Marauders and their crews arrived on Guadalcanal, the living conditions were deplorable. The first time I went into Guadalcanal, we held just about around the circumference of the field. Uh, they were always lobbing shells in there. And uh, sometimes they would have uh, incursions uh, and uh, we could hear firing during the night. It was, it was just very upsetting to, uh, to even be there at that time. 
uh, we lived in slit trenches. We didn't dare uh, live in the tents. If you wanted to sleep, you better be in the slit trench. And uh, our first uh, bivouac area was near, uh, well, it was just a garbage area that they'd covered over. You could smell bodies. Uh, it, if the wind was just right, it was it was just untenable, really. And uh, it was hard living. And I could see that uh, just in the matter of, you know, weeks, the morale would go down because uh, it was such terrible conditions. I, myself, I slept in the trenches. Uh, uh, they had, uh, like moles, they had dug large areas in the ground and they put uh, these uh, limbs across it. Then they put the matting with leaves and such on that and that's how they slept underneath. Now when it rained, the water would come into this and you would just lie in about uh, a half a foot of water. You just lie in it. Now the only thing that our squadron had to eat at that time was these big cans of crackers. These great big tins of crackers and we had, I think it was grape jelly. And that's all I could remember is eating crackers and grape jelly. I washed my teeth with sand. I was young at the time. I didn't have to worry about shaving. I didn't even have any whiskers. But uh, we'd bathe uh, in the sea when we would swim in the salt water there uh, to bathe. And the heat in the daytime was hitting around 125 degrees inside the aircraft. And sometimes you could leave part of your skin on the inside of that aircraft. It was so hot. Another enemy you had to battle were the mosquitoes. They were a problem wherever you were in the Pacific. Slept on the wings of airplanes. There was no place to sleep, no tent, no blankets, no nothing. Well, you didn't need blankets. But you didn't need mosquito nets because the mosquitoes would carry you off. But you'd slept on the wing of the airplane because the higher off the ground you were, the less the mosquitoes bothered you. My turret gunner, old George, uh, one night I saw smoke coming out of the airplane and I run over her and here he is sitting up on the catwalk in the bomb bay of the airplane. And he's got a fire going so he get enough smoke to keep the mosquitoes off of him, if you can believe it. The Marauder men knew that bombs and machine gun bullets constituted a language that needed no interpreter. We were briefed that the Marines would put a red panel out in front of their lines, and anything beyond that line was fair game. So six ships with 2,100-pound bombs took off made a circle out at the end of the runway, came right back over the runway, and we only flew about two minutes when we passed over the panel the Marines had laid out. We were knocked about, I should say, pretty bad from the concussion of our own bombs, being only at a thousand foot in altitude. Every man on the ship had a gun except the pilot and the co-pilot, and they fired everything they had at the, anything that was moving down below. And you could see the gunners shooting up at us as we went over their lines and made a swift turn and to come back. The bombers were used to harass and destroy the enemy supply lines in their air forces. A lot of our targets uh, were jungle targets, and we didn't have the satisfaction of blowing up locomotives and, uh, and warehouses and bridges and uh, petroleum tanks and, uh, and all the good stuff the guys had in Europe. Uh, we would see a Japanese strip down there and nothing else around it. Well, they were, they were masters at camouflage and they'd pull their stuff back in uh, where we couldn't see it. I flew my first mission out of Marsby to Rabaul and all we were told was that we were shown pictures of the Lacanai and Vulcanai airdrome at Rabaul and we were to bomb the runways we take off from Marsby, fly over the Owen Stanley range, go right back down on the water to keep getting picked up by radar. We got on into Rabaul finally with through bad weather and everything, flying about 300 feet. We climbed up to about 4,000 feet. So we opened the Bombay doors and put the plane into a dive. And we crossed the runway, dropped a 100 pound bomb, 300 feet at 400 miles an hour. We destroyed some zeros flying boats and so forth. And as we turned coming off the target to come back to the water to start back to Port Marsby, uh, we came over a building with a red cross on the top of it 
But as we passed over this building, I could see that they had laid out Red Cross panels on the top of the building, yet they had machine guns mounted on the top of it, shooting at us. American ingenuity came into play as the crews modified the planes to fit their needs in combat. For example, these windows and 30 caliber machine guns proved inadequate for the job. All we had in the waist position uh, for guns uh, were two 30 caliber mounts. Uh, and uh, these guns would be poking out these oblique doors in the back. The radio operator, Pat Norton, uh, along with other members of the crew, Johnny Foley, the turret gun and so forth, uh, decided that if Norton had a window that he could look out and kneel and replace those 30 caliber mounts with 50 caliber mounts and get a decent gun down in the waist position, that he may be able to do some good. Instead of lying on his belly, watching these guys flash by, the enemy aircraft uh, before he could even get his finger in the trigger, let alone sight anything, and take a chance on shooting the airplanes next door in the formation, why uh, he could sit up and do the job right. So we stayed up all night, several nights, and carved windows. And the first mission, uh, our, our wingmen uh, let their waste guns fire out the 30 calibers and soon picked the uh, the safe range from those tracers. And then Norton held his fire and cut loose. And uh, the best information we had was that he got two zeros on that first go around. Uh, and within uh, a month, every aircraft of the group was so modified. That later became a factory modification, we're told. There were many different tactics pilots came up with to get away from the Japanese zeros on-the-job training, you might say. Nobody ever told me how to get away from one of them. If you can't outrun them, you can't, I know you can't outrun the bullets. And in desperation, I mean, when they're really pouring it into us, and keep in mind that little 3 8 steel plate that was behind the back, when you can hear those rounds ricocheting off, you get a little bit disturbed. I'd roll the wheel as far as I could to the right and push full that river. No. Imagine a clip like B-26 going along at 300 miles an hour and suddenly have a full right wheel and full left rudder all at the same time. What happened? That thing goes from here 10 miles over there before you know it's happening. Well, I'd get away from it. It worked. Uh, and there we are, tight, flying along. Now, this poor Zero pilot has got to set himself up to attack us. And there may be 8 or 10 or 12 Zeros lined up and these guys, one at a time, mind you, would have to commit themselves to our airplanes. Now, here's a technique. We hold very steady until this fellow had actually committed himself to the attack. He was now fully in, in turn, in his turn. Now his guns would start to fire. And it took a little teeth gritting to wait another several fractions of a second longer until he was now literally almost facing us. Now we do three things. We turn within his radius of turn. We'd lose elevation to pick up speed. And the guy would pull right over the top of us and you watch his head wobbling around in there, almost saying to himself, where'd they go, where'd they go? And he'd go right by us over the top, giving a beautiful, beautiful shot in most instances uh, to our turret. The missions were tough, and for the individual crewmen, it was hard getting accustomed to the idea that the man in the next bunk, who was cracking wise in the morning, was dead at sundown. Combat missions in the Pacific were done at the far range of the B-26. Some crews were lost while coming back from hitting a target. That was one of the reasons the plane was pulled out of this theater after 36 months of operations. But we lost quite a few crews, primarily, to running out of gas engines. Not because we got shot in or anything else. It was just stupidity, running out of gas engines. We could not handle the range that they were assigned. From Port Marjorie to Rabaul and back without getting into any trouble was 
just critical. If you got into any trouble and you had to burn extra gasoline with using more power to get away from it, uh, it just, that ate it up. And it created a bad situation. They decided then that the B-26 was not the proper aircraft to have in uh, the South Pacific. The 22nd Bomb Group converted from B-26s over to B-25 uh, in about June of 1943. Well, I'll say this. You didn't ever take your clothes off. No, no showers or anything? Have a shower up shower. there? Oh. A bath? Maybe about every month or two. Or, well, maybe more often, and they would heat up some water. You'd take all your old clothes off, and uh, there was a sergeant there standing under the heated oil drum, I mean, uh, full of water. Mm -hmm. You'd step under it. He'd give you time to get wet and lather up. You had to step to the side to get uh, uh, and lather up and wash good. Then you could step back under the shower and he would pull the handle and where it would rinse off and you were through. <laughs> and they, uh, a lot of times they sent boatloads of that old clothing home. Really? I'm glad I wasn't on that boat. <laughs> that